exactly. I mean, sorry, you need um, Charlie's thing to actually authorize to bring the writing up to full size. So I kind of want to take a slightly different approach than most of the people who start thinking QKD is small and building up to larger devices. So I want to say, what are the components that we have in large scale quantum computers can we bring across to do QKD or to do quantum repeaters? So I should start by um, saying this is a collaboration between our group at NTT, um, Jörg Swedmeyer's group in Vienna and um, NII. It's also um, partially funded by um, NICT. Okay, so I don't think we have to um, convince this audience that in most quantum tasks that we want, photons are going to have be quite important. QKD, yeah, I don't think I can Q do QKD easily by just taking a matter qubit around. It's possible, but but we want something more. But when we quantum communication, we're going to require photons. Distributed quantum computation, we're going to require photons. So the, the sheer fact is, okay, how am I going to start putting all these systems together? And I want to look at a specific implementation. Oops. So I want to look at NV centers and diamond. Why? It's an interesting physical system. Second, it's what the experimental group we're working with is actually playing with. I'm afraid, um, I will say, NV centers and diamond, room temperature? Nah, <laughs> not in this application. We, we require, probably for these memories, we're probably going to be working 4 to 8K. Sorry, nothing we can do about it. I'd like room temperature, but the microwave properties of these systems just don't work at those temperatures very well. So what are we going to do, and why is our system slightly What's kind of interesting about the dime, the NV centers, is they have both an electron spin, microwave addressable, they have a nuclear spin. Actually, they can have multiple nuclear spins. You could have um, nitrogen 14, nitrogen 15, carbon 13. We're going to choose a sample for convenience here where we're not going to have any carbon 13, but we are going to use nitrogen 15 rather than nitrogen 14. These, can, the stuff, these crystals can be manufactured. We choose nitrogen 15 basically because it's a spin half system. It makes life easier. Nitrogen 14 we can manipulate, but it's much harder. It's also much harder to make the system fault tolerant if you want to get very accurate gates. One of the interesting things um, in the NV center is there is a very nice optical transition that the, in the 600 nanometer regime. In our particular case, the microwave levels, are, we're going to apply about a 20 millitesla field to split a triplet state in, for the NV centers. Why? Because we basically want to use um, a zero state and a plus one state as our particular qubit. The excited state manifold, it's a mess. There's about six or eight levels up there. Um, we're going to be running with a low strain system. We're going to tune our optical transition basically from a zero to a zero spin polarization transition. But quite a bit of care is needed. I mean, just to give you a highlight, we are trying to build these things in Vienna. So Michael Truppe there has got the basic designs of the cavities up and running. We haven't seen everything yet, but um, there is some promising progress in this. Yeah, I don't think I'm authorized to click slides. Next. <laughs> yep. So with diamond, I mean, we don't want to use the diamonds as emitters, okay? Which is how typically diamond is used. Diamond emits a single photon. We want to use, um, basically, some people call it dipole-induced transparency. There's a whole series of names, but we basically want to reflect a photon off a cavity and have the state of the electron spin depend, um, change what happens to our particular photon. Why? What we found is that from the computational purposes, this allows us to build 
theoretically a fault tolerant system where all the error rates are appropriate. But what I want to mention that in Diamond, we have to be very careful. People say, oh, it's a simple, um, tr um, it's a simple Lambda system, it's a simple L system, no problem. But when you actually look at it carefully, this excited state manifold leaks to a metastable state. This metastable state is non-spin preserving. The properties of leakage out of, out of one of the transitions that we want to use is only 1%. But if we manage to get into one of the other transitions, there's a 50% leakage rate to this metastable state. This means if you really want to use this, you've got to be incredibly careful. And one of the reasons that we want to be careful is because we're not the minus one state in the ground state is outside our qubit space. It's very hard for us to monitor. Once it goes into there, we have to do special, we have to take special attention to actually monitor what's going on. Um, one of the things that where we're gonna be very careful, and this comes from computation rather than communication aspects, is that we're, when we monitor the cavity, so we're gonna use this to do measurement as well as entangle, we're only gonna use single photons. We're never gonna put an intense probe beam in to actually um, measure the state of the, of, the, of the electron spin. Why? There is an error channel in this where two photon absorption in the NV center can ionize it. The NV center goes from being NV minus to NV zero, it dies, okay? That's a very hard error to distinguish from various other errors that occur. You can do it, you can reinitialize the NV, but you don't want to do this. This error may be very, very small. It could be as low as 10 to the minus 10. We estimate probably 10 to the minus eight. But if you're building a fault tolerant system that you're gonna to grow to be quite large, actually, you have to be careful that you know where all your error channels are. Next. So in terms of measurement, because hey, if we're gonna use diamond, we've gotta be able to measure it some way. So in this particular case, using this cavity reflection, for a single shot measurement in the NV center, what we estimate is with a reasonable cooperativity of about 10, which is, is strong coupling, there's no way that you ever wanna get into this regime, but with a cooperativity of about 10, you can probably reach a success probability, assuming the photon was there, of maybe 1%. Hey, for fault tolerance, this is not good enough, but what you can do is you, you can do it, um, you, can, you can probe it with many single photons sequentially, and you can drive um, this probability of success for a cooperativity of about 20 down to about 10 to the minus three. If you go through and really tune the parameters, you can get this down, you can drop the cooperativity to about 10, you can take the um, detection efficiency down to about 80%, and you can still reach a success probability of determining the state of the electron spin or the nuclear spin of about one in a thousand, one in 10,000. Next. Okay, so we can measure a photon. NV centers, the electron spin is very easily manipulated, that's just microwave pulses. We can measure the nuclear spin by coupling it to the electron spin and doing our optical readout. What we need to be able to do is we need to be able to distribute entanglement or do the fundamental components in any repeater network. So basically we need some way to do entanglement distribution, purification, entanglement swapping. Okay. I'm gonna need entanglement distribution in two regimes. Next slide, please. I'm gonna need entanglement distribution over both the short range and over the long range. So I'm gonna need um, the long range between the remote parties. I'm gonna need the short range, if I wanna do purification, I want two NV centers sitting in the same physical location but in different cavities, I'm gonna need some way for these to talk while there have been schemes to use spin chains in there to do this, we're just gonna use simple optics in most of the cases. These aren't the most efficient schemes, but they seem to work. So for the short range, basically we're just gonna take a single photon, split it on a beam splitter, bounce it off a photon, uh, bounce it off the cavity mirror, which changes its state, prob 
take the reflective the part of the reflective photon plus the part that, that went straight through the beam splitter, send it through, do the reverse operation here, detect a photon at the dark port. If this works, and this doesn't work very often, this works maybe one time in one time in 10, one time in 50, you get a very high quality entangled state. One of the reasons that we use this type of approach is because we, don't, we want to avoid purification as much as we can. We want to create high quality entangled pairs, both locally and over long distances. And the long distances, the problem that we have, and this is where, where NV centers in some ways are non-ideal, if this is over 10, 20, 30 centimeters, I can just use 650 nanometer light or the NV centers. If I want to do this over longer range, I'm not going to send red light down a fiber. So what, you, what you're going to have to do, whichever way you want to do it, is you're probably going to have to have some, some bell pair source at the telecom wavelengths. You're going to have to send it on Alice's side through a frequency converter and then do a similar operation and then detect one photons. When you detect the appropriate click on one of these detectors, this photon, you release it, it propagates it through the um, channel where Bob tries his entanglement. Over the short, over the long range, and this is where Nicola's comment about memories is important, depending on the distance that you want to communicate, you can either keep the um, information in the electron spins, depending on the distance that they're apart, and that's preferable. If the electron spin lifetime is not long enough, and in diamond, the 100 milliseconds is, is possible under extreme pulse sequences and various things, or you transfer it um, directly into the nuclear spin, which has longer coherence times. We don't want infinite. We know that NV centers are of the order of seconds, but it's something we're aware of. Next slide, please. So just to give you an example of actually how we um, do entanglement within a node. So basically, I'm going to start off with both of my electron spins in a plus state. I'm going to send a single photon in. I'm going to reflect it off the cavity. If the um, electron spin is in the zero state, it reflects with the pi phase shift. If the um, photon comes into the cavity and the cavity was in the plus one state, the photon gets scattered. It doesn't reflect. So if you do this type of case, you send the photon to the second one, you try the same thing. If you get a successful detect, so if you get a successful detection, you end up, ta you end up um, having an entangled pair in your electron spins. If it failed, restart again and restart again until it works. Once you have the electron Do we have another one? No, it's back. I'll just use it as is. <laughs> so once we've got the um, information in the electron spins, we can transfer it to the nuclear spins via the local operation. So this allows us, within the local node, to do entanglement swapping via CNOT gates and various things. Next slide, please. So in terms of the scheme, experimentally, if you look at where all the schemes are, are we at the state required for quantum computation? The answer is that for almost all the areas, we are below threshold. So for the various nuclear spin coherence times, electron spin coherence times, measurement error rates, rotation errors, timing resolution, this looks possible. Some of these aren't in the, some of these are technically in the fault tolerant regime, but they're not in our desired level, so there's some improvement. But these kind of give us the components that we can use for starting to do repeaters. Next slide, please. So the question is, if I want to do a very simple repeater chain, and maybe I shouldn't call this a repeater, I'll call this a relay, okay? Because the first scheme, no error correction. No purification. We're just going to assume we have high enough quality entanglement between the particular nodes um, and just do the entanglement swapping to see what happens. And I mean, I plot, and both the, the raw rate and the normalized rate, 
I prefer the normalized rate, and I should explain my normalization, okay? My normalization is to take the total number of NV centers in the entire system and divide through by it. There's no universally accepted way that this works, but parts of the repeater community are starting to think about dividing through by the total number of resources. That could be NV centers, it could be number of photons. In this particular case, the number of photons and NV centers are roughly the same. So that, I mean, we're not getting bad distances. Bad, I mean, these are a few hertz rates. Um, basically, you see where the peaks are. But hey, I want slightly better. Next slide, please. So, I mean, there's been no multiplexing. That previous scheme was just basically two NV centers per cavity. If we go to multiplexing, I mean, we're using an asymmetric version of multiplexing here, N to one. You could use symmetric if you want, it's your choice. Then basically your rate doubles effectively if you want, but it's still, it's still quite, um, it's still at 500K. These normalized rates aren't, aren't particularly great. Five hertz, but hey, it's something we've got to live with. What happens if I want to go longer? Next slide. Then I actually have to use purification. I don't like purification. Well, I don't like normal purification because I don't want lots of classical communication. I don't want to be having to send messages over my entire network saying, this purification worked, this purification worked, this failed, this failed. So we don't want to do the typical two-way purification. So what we're gonna do is we'll use error correction instead. It requires higher thresholds, but it makes the classical propagation of information much simpler. So basically, using error correction, simple error correction for repeater schemes, it is a bit of an overkill, but it, simplify, it really does simplify things. Next slide, please. So I mean, there, there has been previous work where people have showed that error correction can do purification. It depends on your local gate error rates. One of the reasons we were so pedantic about saying we wanted these 0.1% error rates was because we had in mind doing error correction. Next slide, please. So over 2,000K network. For the same level of fidelity at the end, is error correction worth it? Does error correction actually allow you to um, improve your rate? And this is a biased slide. So on the bottom line, we kind of do the number of nodes without error correction versus the number of nodes with error, with error correction. This is the no error correction line. And so the first thing is, hey, if you want error correction to be beneficial, put the nodes closer together. No choice. The slide very clearly shows this, that for 10, here, so basically at 10 nodes, you probably require 20 nodes with the 25 cubic code to get an improvement. Okay, maybe I can live with that. But there's another constraint. These initial network nodes have to be greater than the attenuation length of the fiber. If these nodes become less than 25K, error correction never has an improvement. So, so basically there, there are trade-offs hidden in this. I mean, we still believe um, if I'm gonna do error correction, what codes do I wanna use? I mean, there's a zoo of codes out there. Choose your favorite one. We've tended to use the topological codes. They require more qubits, but they're much more um, resilient to local error rates and the local gate errors. Next slide. Because one of the things that we want to do longer term is to take a whole series of nodes and actually start building um, large-scale distributed clusters. So we don't want something that's infinite, but we may want a hundred distributed um, cluster over many, many sites. So next slide, please. And I think that's it for today. So I say it's the beginning or the end. Either this shows that repeaters are potentially interesting, or it shows that repeaters are so complicated, why are we even thinking about them? I'll leave that for the audience to decide. Thank you. Thank you very much.
to the time, there are three seconds for a question, but clearly we have a question, we have a time for this. But it looks like people want to prepare to the public uh, lecture I mean, in an hour. It is very late or very early for many people in this audience. <laughs> okay, so thank you. I hope uh, it will work. <laughs> Thank you.